Sexual Utopia and Power, published in 2015 by Countercurrents. It's an interpretation of uh, the sexual revolution, which takes account of, um, you could say, the, the, the point of view of feminine sexuality. I was dissatisfied with a lot of right-wing critiques of the sexual revolution because they seem to be written from an exclusively masculine point of view. Uh, they see the sexual revolution as, a, as something which made lots more sex available to men uh, uh, without really taking into account uh, women's choices. Uh, of course, women have their own sexual nature, which is to, to mate with uh, high status men, especially. And so the result of the sexual revolution was not more sex for men in general, but more sex for a rather small number of high status men. In effect, the society became polygamous. And uh, uh, this was widely misunderstood as something that which benefited men in general at the expense of women. In fact, it didn't. It resulted in a lot of, a lot of unhappy bachelors, uh, a lot of un unhappy people of both sexes. The second wave of feminism, which Betty Friedan represents, was mainly concerned about getting women into the, to the workplace, which uh, made the workplace, it, well, it brought sex into the workplace, obviously. It, it brought in the problems that are now referred to as sexual harassment, meaning men acting like men around women. It was an, an, an inevitable byproduct of having women enter the workforce. Of course, plenty, plenty of women uh, uh, look for husbands among the men they work with as well. It's not just men who, who do this, but uh, nobody criticizes women for doing it. It's, uh, the, the feminist rule is always blame the men. Blame the men for looking for girlfriends where they work, but uh, you know, of course women do the same thing. A lot of people don't realize that one of the functions of a church in a traditional society was it was where you went to see girls <laughs> uh, because everybody they were always at home the rest of the week but in in church you could see them and that, that's that, that's how people found mates uh, for much of our history uh, nowadays well the church the churches have deteriorated and other uh, traditional uh, uh, institutions such as dances have, uh, have deteriorated. On some colleges, the only, the only uh, dances that are held anymore are for the homosexuals. <laughs> they have dances where they can, they can meet uh, other, other gay people, but uh, ordinary, peop ordinary kids don't have any place to go and meet, so they're stuck with online dating, which has plenty of disadvantages, of course. And of course, the, the feminists are working to make it difficult. That's the whole point of, uh, of the sexual harassment movement is to make it more difficult for men to find mates. We hear a lot about um, casting couch scandals in Hollywood. Probably uh, women trying to get roles by sleeping with men is just as common as men trying to use their position to go to bed with young actresses, you know. Again, it's something that both sexes engage in, dishonorable behavior. 
but uh, one sex is blamed. You know, there, men, ha men have a natural reluctance to want to hold women accountable for their actions. Our natural instinct is to protect women. And so when women misbehave, we're much more likely to give them a pass on it. And so that, that, uh, that has been essential to the rise of feminism. Additional chivalry, that is, has contributed to the rise of uh, militant anti-male feminism. The effect is cer certainly uh, depopulation. Uh, European nations are, have the lowest fertility of any countries in the world now. Um, and uh, yes, a lot of it, of course, also has to do simply with women uh, wasting their most fertile years trying to get established in careers. And uh, this, this also serves to uh, glut the market with labor and to bring down wages for men, making it harder for them to support a, a, a stay-at-home wife even if they would like to do so. Feminism is a chief cause of the population decline among whites. I don't think that what's called first wave feminism, which was mainly concerned with the female franchise, did not really have much of an, of an effect. But in the post war in the post-war era when women began to enter the workplace, and it really happened uh, on a large scale as recently as the 1980s, has had a devastating effect on family life. You know, we, uh, somebody's written a, a book about uh, modern American culture with the title, There's No Place Like Work. We seem to uh, to value, you know, like a lot of our conservatives are focused on economic issues. We seem to value economic productivity and the whole world of work uh, at the expense of home and family life, which really ought to be more important, in my opinion. Feminism is not of Jewish origin. Uh, it's something that can be traced back to Mary Wollstonecraft in England, and, and the first wave of feminism did not, uh, you know, that is the suffrage movement, did not have a lot of Jewish influence as far as I know, although Jewish women may have supported it. But uh, beginning with what's called second wave or post-war feminism, Betty Friedan, what happened in the 60s, uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish women took a leading role in that, as, just as Jewish men have taken a, a leading role in other radical movements. I actually asked Kevin McDonald once directly whether uh, he considered feminism a, a, a part of the Jewish strategy and he said no because he, he, he couldn't see that how feminism was directed at pursuing specifically Jewish ends. Maybe it's not, but you know, uh, Jews do uh, produce a, a wildly disproportionate number of the radicals in, in various domains, and so they have done so in femin fem feminism also. Although perhaps, as I say, feminism was not Jewish in origin, but uh, sure, they have contributed to it uh, out of all proportion to their numbers, just as they have with other radical causes. Islam has a, a sort of inbuilt security against it. They, they're, uh, they do not, it's not really possible for feminism to influence them in a way that it is possible for it to influence uh, Christian-derived peoples. Some East Asian countries have below, uh, have below, uh, below replacement fertility now. Philosophically, you can trace egalitarianism back through Rousseau, even as far as Hobbes, but I, I imagine that much more important in, um, in practice is simply the resentment of lower achieving peoples. Uh, I can understand how many people who find it difficult to thrive in the modern world resent people who do, who do succeed. And I think a lot of white resentment really just comes from that. Not, it's not that we're trying to humiliate anyone, but, but we do have that effect on certain, on some people who uh, are just not able to be as successful as we are. Marriage is uh, an economic and sexual union between a man and a woman. 
and so both sides have to be considered. There's been a revolution in sex, and there's also been a, a, a revolution in our uh, way of working uh, with, uh, with women in the workplace. As I say, it, 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 it lowers men's wages and thereby makes men less attractive to women as providers. So it has a kind of a, uh, it's a kind of a vicious circle. Uh, we started by uh, allowing women uh, into the workplace as a choice and now many women find out that they no longer have a choice. They're forced to work, they can't find any man who can support them without working and uh, it's very often difficult for them to see that, uh, that it's actually feminism that got them into this difficulty. That, uh, 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 more desirable mates, mates better able to support them, were available before women entered the workplace. Primitive societies are polygamous, that's the norm. Uh, the wealthy men have as many wives as they can support, as, uh, as many children as they can pay for. Um, Monogamy was a way, it was a, a form of sexual egalitarianism. It, give, it gave every man a stake in the future by giving him a family. Uh, that is the real advantage of monogamy. It's not, it's not so much to benefit women and children, although it does. Uh, it, in societies where polygamy is practiced, such as uh, Islamic societies, there are a lot of bachelors because the wealthy men monopolize a lot of the women. So there are a lot of young men that cannot find wives. And these men tend to behave in antisocial ways. In the Muslim world, this is where a lot of the suicide bombers come from. They have this idea that if they just die a martyr's death, they'll get their 72 virgins in heaven, you know, and, uh, and so they're quite happy to, uh, to wage jihad against us. Uh, monogamy uh, makes society more stable by giving all men a stake in the future. It's possible, of course, for a, a woman to be a pathological altruist. One of the examples that researchers use when they, dis when they don't talk about whites as pathological altruists, they like to talk about abused women who will stay with their man who mistreats them for many, many years and uh, uh, rather than leaving him as an example of pathological altruism. It, it is an example, but it's a politically correct example. Perhaps a, a more important example is the altruism of, of many white people who want to rescue third worlders from themselves, essentially, by inviting them into our wealthy countries. Sweden is probably the perfect example, but we have plenty of people like that in the United States, too. Yes, that's a form of, of altruism that doesn't even really help, in many cases, the, the objects of charity. Uh, it, it obviously harms us, and it, it means that the immigrants grow up alienated from their own culture in many ways. So, so yes, it, that's why it's pathological. Women uh, often are, are those who are most anxious to open the borders and to allow third worlders in. It seems to be a misdirection of the maternal instinct somehow. In Sweden, it's become scandalous actually that, that the, uh, the people who are supporting mass immigration tend to be childless women in middle age. Uh, in, and in many cases, what's going on is actually rather sordid. They, you know, they sleep with the young men from the Muslim world who are notorious for not being especially picky about women. And so you'll see these middle-aged feminists with no families who, who have not had the opportunity to raise a normal white family and they direct their sexual and their maternal instincts toward these often hostile outsiders. It's, uh, it's something very, uh, uh, very pathological. And uh, it's one of the main reasons we need to put an end to feminism because there's a kind of a symbiosis between feminism and mass immigration. Northern Europeans 
uh, Europeans in general actually have a tendency toward monogamy anyway. Uh, many pagan societies were monogamous. Um, outsiders found this odd, but you know, among the Germanic tribes, even the top guy would only have one wife. So it's something that uh, I think in some ways it's an adjustment to the severe climate of the North. Uh, and Christianity uh, served to reinforce it and, and make it universal. Um, certainly, uh, certainly we could uh, change the laws. What we have now I have described as a kind of rotating polyandry where a, a woman can take a husband get rid of him, continue to collect support from him while moving in with another man. And uh, this is a manifest injustice and it needs to be shut down. We need to put the divorce industry out of business. What? See, the state's not necessary uh, for family formation. You don't, you don't actually need a government to recognize your uh, marriage, to have uh, marriages and families. But you do need a government with a powerful police force to have divorce. Divorce relies on uh, the police enforcing an order that says that a man's home is no longer his home, for example. So uh, the divorce regime is, is simply a part of the, uh, the hypertrophy of the state, the excessive growth of, of the managerial state. Of black, uh, uh, the breakdown of monogamy among blacks, that's relatively simple to explain. There's a chapter in my book, Sexual Utopia in Power, on uh, African mating patterns, which are very different from European. Uh, West Africa, the home of, uh, you know, the land of origin of American blacks, is actually the most polygamous place in the world. And uh, I, I remember uh, some years ago reading that uh, there was a wealthy man in Nigeria who had 26 wives, you know, far beyond anything that Islam would allow. And uh, so what you're seeing in, uh, in the black population in America is really simply a return to African norms under welfare state conditions. Africans actually became reasonably monogamous. The divorce rate was never, it was always, it was always a, a less monogamous than the white population, but uh, African Americans benefited from monogamy and benefited from the presence of fathers in their children's lives when that was still enforced as a cultural norm among Americans. Uh, now that it's not, you know, as soon as, as, soon as uh, welfare, the welfare state was introduced, uh, uh, blacks very quickly returned to the polygamous norms of their ancestral land, of Africa. The same thing is happening with Europeans, but much more slowly since we have a longer evolutionary history in Europe. Oh, transgenderism? <laughs> I think that's uh, what some people call peak liberalism. I don't expect the transgender madness to go on very long. It's just too unnatural. You see, feminism ha does offer women some things that they like, like economic independence. You know? But what does transgenderism offer anybody? That's just a freak show. I, I, I expect it will pass in a few awesome. years. There's always been a certain amount of homosexuality um, in society, maybe two or three percent of the people. As long as it doesn't, as, as long as it's not publicly promoted, I would have no problem with uh, just the government taking no account of, of homosexuality, homosexuality at all, just having no laws relative to it. I don't think we should do any accommodation to homosexuals. I don't think we should persecute them, but I don't think we need to accommodate them. Uh, it's something that has always existed in small amounts on the margins of society, and in my opinion, that's where it belongs. If children were vulnerable to homosexualist propaganda, there would be a lot more homosexuals than there are. They actually have not succeeded in raising the percentage of homosexuals in the general population very much beyond what it was before. So the, the, from their point of view, the, prop, the propaganda has not been all that successful. 
What I expect to happen is that the, the women who are most devoted to feminism and the rejection of traditional roles simply will not reproduce. And so uh, the women who do give birth to the, to the next generation will be those who buck the trend and live more traditional lives. And the result will be that any tendencies toward feminism uh, that may be in our genes will be bred out of the population. It could be that the long-term effects of feminism will be to leave women more domestic, more family-oriented than they otherwise would have been. I think that our way of life now is very unnatural and I think that people will be much happier when they, when they live uh, more, more in the way that our grandparents took for granted. I think that a return to natural norms is inevitable. Uh, I think the people who, who say that we cannot go back to the past uh, are, could not be more mistaken. In fact, there are actual historical examples already of uh, societies that went back to the past. I'll give you an example, and it's cited in my book. In the latter part of the 19th century in Belgium, a lot of women were working, and there was a mass movement of women out of the workplace and back into the home in the second half of the 19th century in Belgium and some other European countries. So when people tell you that, it can't, that, that, that you can't turn back the clock, you, you can point out to them it actually has been done. I write for the Occidental Observer and the Occidental Quarterly fairly frequently. Interestingly, we're here at Montgomery Bell uh, State Park and we have internet connectivity here, but I notice that the one site you cannot visit is the Occidental Observer. You cannot get, there's, you see, there, there's sensorware. I think the ADL may be involved. They, they produce sensorware, which they sell to various public institutions. And so I was able to go to VDARE, to Amrin.com, but not the Occidental Observer, because they, they discuss Jewish issues very openly. It's edited by Kevin McDonald, and if anybody out there has not taken a look at it, you should. And read the Occidental Quarterly, which is our forum for longer format, more, more scholarly articles. Mm -hmm.